<laughs> now I know what it is. Hey there, and welcome back to Eggs. Today's special guest is author, guest speaker, entrepreneur, and advisor and partner at online business brokerage Quiet Light, Joe Valley. Over the last nine years, Joe, in addition to building and selling a half dozen of his own companies, has mentored thousands of entrepreneurs whose goal it is to achieve their own eventual exit. He is a certified mergers and acquisitions professional and a frequent guest expert in mastermind groups, on podcasts, and at events for entrepreneurs worldwide. Joe joins us today to talk about his latest book, The Exitpreneur's Playbook, How to Sell Your Online Business for Top Dollar. In the book, he shares real life stories of successful and failed exits and teaches you how to reverse engineer a pathway to your own incredible exit. Here to talk about all that and so much more, please join us in welcoming to the show, Joe Valley. Hey, Joe, how are you? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thrilled to death. And just so everybody can see it, here's the book. Uh, it's an extra ex, or Exitpreneur's Playbook, a uh, how to sell your online business for top dollar, reverse engineering your pathway to success. It's available now. Uh, I have, uh, you know, in full transparency, just begun reading it. Um, I'm about halfway through and, uh, and I'm loving it. And it's funny, uh, you know, so Joe, I, as I'm going through this book, and, and this will be, you know, a lot of the questioning I've got for you is the, you know, issues in trying to develop a startup if you hadn't thought of doing it in the first place, right? So for example, in my world, I run a marketing agency. I've been doing it for about 15 years. And it never occurred to me that I might one day want out of this thing, right? <laughs> because, you know, yeah. I started into it as a passion. I started chasing it down. It grew from basically being a side hustle into a kind of a business. Although, you know, in technical terms, it's a business. But like, if you were to look at my books and everything, you just, you'd, your jaw would hit the floor. But, you know, but it was just not built as a business from the beginning. And it certainly wasn't built with an exit in mind. But yeah, what's yeah. interesting in just the little bit of reading I've been able to do so far in your book, it's actually inspiring me to go start up some of the other ideas that I've thought of, but with the end in mind in the first place. So, yeah, uh, yeah. so anyway, your book is sort of already steering me down an interesting path. With well, I appreciate that. You know, most people that start, uh, you know, a business for the first time, never think about uh, the end in mind. Uh, and the, the old saying, you should always start with the end in mind when it comes to business, meaning uh, plan your exit the day you start your business. I don't agree with because I didn't do it when I launched my first business. But when you sell that first business, the next one you start, you know, you're thinking about that exit because most of the money you make from your business comes the day that you sell it, not when you're operating it, unless you can operate it for a couple of decades, right? Um, but, you know, think with the end in mind, only if you've done it before, uh, the first time you're starting the business, just keep the wheels on the bus and try to stay profitable. Yeah, well, and actually, that's one of the things that you mentioned in your book that I thought was really interesting was this uh, idea that you actually get about 50% of your total earnings over the life of a business mm. in your sale. So, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, obviously there's some math problems in the book that sort of explain this uh, thoroughly, but that, that statistic really jumped out to me as something interesting. Yeah. Not only is it true that in most cases you get more than 50% of all the money you'll ever make from your business on the day that you sell it, but you'll also pay less in taxes because it's capital gains taxes, not personal income taxes. Yeah. I love that. And it's something, I mean, I guess it's very obvious, right? Like if you really stop and think about some of these huge exits you hear about in the news and things like that, you know, when they're making, you know, Hey, I don't know. I'm thinking of one in particular that was a $6 billion IPO, you know, and, and he jumps out of the business and he walks away with all these billions. Like he did never made that on his own. Right. It all never, sale. So never even somebody I was talking to just literally an hour ago has a business does 35 million in revenue, but he's not profitable. He's just growing the business, building that recurring revenue aspect of it. The cost per acquisition is very high but he's not profitable. So he's not making any money. His goal is to make money on the exit. And in that space, the pet food space, you know, we're looking at, you know, a hundred million dollar exit for him someday, which is really strange because he's not really making a profit all along the way. So his money is going to be in the exit. It's something that the larger companies and larger entrepreneurs know of, but in the sub $25 million space, which is mostly where we play, um, business owners are just starting to become aware of it. That yeah. they make most of it on the, on the way out. Yeah, I love that. And I do want to dig into it a little bit more, but maybe I got a little bit over my skis and I want to try and back up a little bit and just sort of ask you, you know, for a little bit of background information on who you are, what you do. I mean, we covered a little bit at the top, yeah. but people who don't know what Quiet Light does, do you mind just sort of filling us in? 
Yeah. So uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I sold my last e-commerce business in uh, 2010 and I did it through Quiet Light when the team was a team of two. Um, now we're a team of about 30. Uh, I took a year off after selling my business and then joined Quiet Light. Uh, and the original founder, Mark Doust, uh, and I are business partners now. It was founded in 2007. And since I sold my uh, business and joined the team, I've personally sold about 100 million in total transactions and uh, helped about, facilitate about another half billion through uh, the rest of the team. And everybody on the team is an online entrepreneur, first and foremost. And they've all built, bought, sold their own online business, just like I have. I've owned about six different businesses, built, bought, or sold. Um, and now I, I actually have two. Now I have Quiet Light and Exopreneur from uh, the, the playbook itself. But I had, you know, over the last decade or so, I've talked about 8,000 entrepreneurs. And I actually tallied this up. I'm like, how many did I talk to a week? I had to go back and look at it and do some rough math. But it's, it's at least 8,000 entrepreneurs over the last decade, one-on-one -on -one conversations about their business. And I thought about how they were drinking through a fire hose, learning everything I was trying to share with them and how uh, th th there's no way to absorb it. Uh, so uh, I had I had the goal of putting it all in one unified format. And that's what came out of, you know, the book is what came out of it. And that's what launched last summer. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think, you know, one of these things, and, and I can just sort of speak from my own experience here. I spend a lot of time online watching YouTube videos, trying to learn all I can, taking courses, you know, all these things. But like, you kind of never know when enough's enough or when you actually have the piece of knowledge that will be the one that serves you. You know, like it's difficult to really draw a line that, okay, I've, I've hit my goal today. Now I know enough. <laughs> but what I really like about your book and, you know, I'm sure that there are, you know, extraneous things that, you know, one couldn't account for in a book. But nonetheless, what I like about it is sort of this format, this playbook format, where it really drives you from start to finish. And so I wonder if we could maybe start there, uh, you know, back kind of at the beginning of this book and, and where a small business person might start. I started a little bit, you know, with maybe teasing the question at the beginning of the show, which is, you know, for small business, and I'm talking small businesses, right, who, you know, and I imagine a large portion of them were started not as a long-term investment, but as a labor of love, you know, they're really yeah. good at making cakes. And so they made a bakery or they're really good at doing, you know, whatever yard work. And so they start a, a landscaping. Business. Yeah. But it doesn't really, you know, I guess when you come into a business from that approach and you're not like buying into a company as an investment, or you're not building it with sort of that end in mind that we discussed earlier, you know, how could a small business person get a start, you know, I guess sort of riding the ship. Because I guess even for most small businesses, even if they don't do a bad job, they probably aren't doing an adequate job to turn around and sell the thing. Well, honestly, the first thing is pretty simple. It's, it's set a goal, right? Uh, you know, most people just flounder day to day and just are grinding it out as, a, as an entrepreneur. Either you've got a full-time job and this is a side hustle and you're just trying to make some money every month, but you don't have a specific goal in terms of an exit or a goal in terms of uh, exit without exiting, meaning somebody would actually run the business for you. So first and foremost, set a goal. And I like to do that with very specific things, uh, dollars, date, and feeling. Uh, and the, the last one's kind of touchy-feely, obviously, but you know, th the way it would go is I want to sell my business for a million dollars in the first quarter of 2023. And when I do, I, I'm going to feel amazing because I'm unburdened. I'm out of debt. My kid's college is paid for and I get to spend more time with my family. That last part, that feeling part is what will help every entrepreneur get over those really tough days, weeks, and months that we all have. I've had them. I've, I've had years where I've made a ton of money. And uh, then the next year I've lost a quarter of a million dollars. That's just life as an entrepreneur. And when you set that feeling goal and you have clear objectives, that helps you um, stay focused on, on the vision that you're trying to uh, accomplish. Then the next step is actually reverse engineer a path to that. The problem uh, is that we can set a goal. I, I was on a call with somebody the other day, a, a podcast like this, and they had you know, a unicorn in the background because they want to have a billion dollar valuation of their business. Like, okay, well, how do you get there? Where are you today? And they had no idea what the current value of their business is. So they don't know how close or how far they are to that. And that's a, a lot of the, what's in the book will help them with that. Um, but you gotta, you gotta figure out where you are today. You know, if you're in Portland, Maine, and you want to go to Boise, Idaho, and you pull it up on Google maps, you can put in Boise, but if you can't find Portland where your starting point is, you're not going to get there in a direct path. So it's the same thing with your business. 
Um, so figure out where you are today and then figure out what the strengths and weaknesses are of the business, what buyers want, what they don't want, what brings value, what plummets value, all those different things um, are not easy to learn, to be blunt and to be honest. Uh, and, and you got to take it in bite-sized pieces. But when you, when you do that, um, you're, you're, you're building towards something really dramatic, which is the exit of your business and real money in the bank. Um, in, in most cases, the most money anybody's ever seen in the bank account. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And, and what I like about it, and, and actually it's just the thing you lead with. I, I had a note here. You start the book with this quote or this idea that every wall or every door is a wall. And for me, that, I guess, sort of sets the tone for this book and that it's a, uh, you know, it, it's an optimistic outlook, right? No matter what your roadblock is, no matter what your barrier is, it's your job to find a way through it. And what I like about that is I think it really dovetails nicely into this idea of goal setting, because I think there are so many people, you know, and, you know, again, speaking from my own experience, maybe I'm worse than most people, but I, I suspect that a lot of people who sort of got into business as a labor of love or through a trade or something like that, you know, probably haven't really gotten good about setting goals and things. And, and you know, basically they've, uh, what's the phrase? They, they created themselves a job. They didn't build a business. Yes. And so, and I know that in my case, that's, you know, what I've done is I built a job and it's managed to feed and house my family for, you know, almost 20 years. And, you know, it's been very worthwhile in that end. But what I'm finding is now that I'm getting older and I'm putting more and more thought to what comes next, um, I'm looking at my business and going, my goodness, like who, who could buy this thing? Right. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a mess. Yeah. And so, you know, so goal setting, I think is obviously a great point. And it's interesting because I'm reading a book by Jim Rome right now, and it's kind of the same thing leads with mm -hmm. goals. And I've tried to do this exercise myself and it is, it's hard, you know, it's difficult, but what I like about the way that you're approaching it versus sort of, you know, you hear things like the, uh, the smart approach and some of these other approaches to goal setting, this idea of dollars, date and feeling, I think does a good job of solidifying how much money you want to make when you want to make it. And, you know, I think you do have to pay credence to those sort of emotional aspects of it. You have to, you have to, because, you know, as, as an advisor on the other side of the deal, the one that's helping people exit their business, I can learn all the technical aspects of listing a business, doing financials, getting a business prepared for sale. But the, the thing that I'm actually um, the best at is managing people's emotions and expectations because you are going to be very emotional when you sell your business, not because you're sad that you're not going to have it anymore, but because you're so afraid the deal is going to fall through two weeks before closing and, and, and working with people on the, the, that, that aspect of it is critical. That's why you've got to have clear, concise goals and how you want to feel about it at the end of the day. Um, because we're emotional creatures. That's the bottom line. But then you've got to figure out those little nuances. You said something about your business that you've been running for 20 years. Who's going to take this over? How do I transfer control of this business? Well, that is one of you know, the, the four things that buyers look at, really five things that buyers look at. They look at risk, growth, transferability, documentation, and then they look at the owner of the business. So it, it goes to say without um, all of the assets of the business uh, transferring to the new owner. If you can't transfer all those assets, you really don't have a sellable business. So you've got to figure out a way to make sure you're removing yourself from the equation as much as possible and setting up so that I could step in and do what you do and take over your customer base and, and grow the business further. If, if you're the key figure, if you're the name and the face of the business, you may have to stick around for a while just to be that figurehead, I'll, I'll take you out of the daily grind. I'm going to take over the daily grind. You just be that figurehead, strategic advisor, maybe have some conversations, your name's on emails, things of that nature. But, but, but that's the problem with people that um, are owner operators, that they're the name and face of the business is the transferability aspect becomes pretty difficult. Yeah, it makes sense. So I guess then to that end, there's, I, there's sort of two things that I wanted to ask is, first of all, do, you know, speaking of emotions and things like that, knowing that a lot of these businesses come from a sort of emotional place, or at least we have this belief that we've put sort of our blood, sweat, and tears into this thing. Do, do entrepreneurs or, you know, especially small entrepreneurs tend to over-evaluate or under-evaluate their businesses when they start looking at a sale? That's, that's a great question. Um, surprisingly, they under-evaluate it most times because they don't know how to do uh, what's called a proper add back schedule. This is where we're going to get into the weeds and get technical. So we won't go too deep in there, but um, I find that if, if people, people have conversations with 
you know, people in their mastermind groups and uh, colleagues and at events, and they read things online and they say, well, I, I heard, you know, John just sold his business for a six time multiple. That's what I want. I want six times. But the problem is they don't know six times what? Well, it's six times the profit. No, it's not actually. It's six times the discretionary earnings. Well, how do you calculate says discretionary earnings? It's net income plus ad backs. Oh, what's an ad back? It's my salary, right? Yes, but there's 18 other types of ad backs as well. It's so many nuances and details to it. Uh, so it, it, because of that, people uh, in, in many cases, they think about the multiple and then they figure out the dollar amount, but the multiple is too high and the dollar amount is too low, if you understand. Uh, multiple ranges, um, you know, six time multiple would be very strong. But at the end of the day, it's dollars that you put into the bank account, not the multiple. So instead of saying, I want a six time multiple, you want to say, I want a million dollars for my business. Really, that business would probably get a three and a half to four time multiple of seller's discretionary earnings because of a proper ad back schedule. So when I do the math on the proper ad back schedule, their discretionary earnings is higher. The multiple comes lower, but the total dollar value on the exit is higher in most cases. So is this idea of a multiple, is that really sort of, a, I don't know, like a jargony metric that's used sort of in, in sales and things like that as sort of maybe a way to set like, I don't know, way find your place a little bit, but, but really it has more to do with this dollars and cents bit. It is, it is the metric that people use in this world, selling their business for a multiple of seller's discretionary earnings. The big problem is that most people don't calculate seller's discretionary earnings properly. Um, it, there are exceptions to every rule. Let's just face that. And so, you know, a, a SaaS business that is growing like crazy and, and everything's getting reinvested into the business and the development of it may at one point flip from, uh, a multiple of sales discretionary earnings to a multiple of revenue. Same with an agency in some cases, but for the most part, if you've got a, a product or a content or a smaller SaaS business, it's going to be a multiple of sellers discretionary earnings. Okay. Fair enough. So I guess then to that end, you know, understanding that, I mean, is it ever too late to start preparing a, a plan? I mean, just like you could, I guess at any time, you know, write the ship or, or create a new business plan. Uh, is it ever too late to start planning for a sale, even if that's not what you began life? No, 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 no. I mean, you've, you've got to, I mean, if you're, if you're going to be training, I like the word training instead of planning because everybody hates exit planning. So get, get, get training for your eventual exit. So you know what the heck you're doing along the way. It's never too late, but the reality is if you wake up and decide to sell your business, you're probably not going to get the same value you would if you had reached out to an advisor six or 12 or 18 months in advance. That's what we're there for. That's what a good advisor is going to do. There's no, it, it, let me explain the difference. Um, in the M&A world, when you get fairly large, they might charge, you know, uh, an investment banker may charge a retainer fee and work towards uh, coaching you over 12 to 18 months to get your business ready for sale. In the world that I live in, the sub 25 million range, and we, we're going above that now, but let's just say it's there, 250,000 to 25 million. Um, the advisors in this world are here to help first and foremost, uh, educate you and give you the tools and resources you need to right the ship, to focus on what the weaknesses of your business are and the strengths of your businesses are and get you educated on what a, a, you know, the, the real values of the business are. But it's it, the better, the sooner you can start thinking about that, the sooner you can uh, make these little tweaks to the business and understand uh, that sooner you'll reach that exit goal. Um, and you'll do it, you know, with a healthier business. And the more healthy your business is, the better your business is. And that's part of the mind shift, you know, not selling the business just for you to make the most money, but selling a great business for a great buyer to take over at a great price. Everybody wins and you actually make more money at the end of the day and you get a better deal too. It may be mostly raw cash if you, if you structure it right and it's, and it's just simply a great business for people to take over. Yeah. Well, maybe let's take a minute here. I actually had planned this more towards the end of the conversation, but maybe it makes sense to insert it now. This idea of like when we would need an agent or a helper, you know, mm -hmm. uh, versus when we don't, right? So, I mean, I guess theoretically, you could run out and try and sell your business on your own. Maybe you can broker a deal. Maybe somebody can show up, you know, whatever. Maybe the pieces yeah. will fall right and you can do it. Yeah. Just like anything, you know, whether you, uh, you know, sure, you could run QuickBooks yourself, but you will often hire a CPA or somebody. Please do. Out. Not a CPA, a, a an e-commerce bookkeeper. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, or, you know, what, whatever it is, right? We have professional yeah. services out there because there are things that we have deemed 
you know, it, it's worthy of having a professional look at this. Yeah. And so I presume in the business sales industry, it's sort of the same argument for why you might need an agent. But can you talk about why or when, like, when would I come to you guys? Like right now, I happen to know that, you know, my business is in a condition that is not sellable. But if I was starting to think about it and say, okay, maybe in the next five years, I want to get out. Yeah. Like is five years too soon to engage with you guys? Or is, you know, is this really more of like a, in the, in the home stretch, I've already done all the legwork or at what point should we engage? And can you talk yeah. just a little bit about just sort of what the, the process is like? I'd say probably a couple of years out is the longest distance that we start having conversations with clients. Uh, there's again, exceptions to every rule. I got a call from somebody the other day that I hadn't talked to since 2019. Now we're almost near the end of 21 and he's ready to exit. Uh, and so that, I guess that's roughly two years, but yeah, two years, I would say if you're five years out, even two years out, that's the, the point and purpose of the Exitpreneur's playbook so that you can start to digest that information um, on your own uh, as you're thinking about an eventual exit or reverse engineering a path to those goals to actually engage or talk with an advisor um, where you set up a call with them and you have you know, a discovery call and then you're sharing your financials so they can give you a, a good valuation point where you are today. I'd say you know, a couple of years out is, is probably the longest time that we see people want to engage with us. And it's not a contract. It's, ha it's a, have a conversation with us um, to figure out how close or how far they are from that exit goal. You can do a lot of it with the details in the book, but it gives you kind of like a, I haven't taken karate for so long. I want to say maybe a blue belt, right? But you're not a black belt at that point, but it gives you a lot of good information to, uh, to think about and, and give ballpark numbers on what your business might be worth. Well, I suppose too, the role of the advisor is to take the questions that come up, you know? So for example, I'm sitting and scribbling in the, uh, you know, in the margins of the book as I'm reading through the book, but I mean, that's not getting me the answer. That's getting me a, a to-do yeah. list item right now. I have mm -hmm. up. So I guess, you know, the real life version of the book, you in this case, is that, you know, somebody would contact you with you, get a phone call, and then, you know, they could ask the questions that they might've picked up either in the book or somewhere else. Yeah. And look, as I said earlier, I've, I've talked to 8,000 people over the last decade, but think about how many entrepreneurs that are, are out there that maybe wanted to have a conversation, but were afraid to. They thought maybe the advisor is going to try to get their hooks into them for a commission. Um, more people are not, they say that I'm just not ready to sell my business. Of course you're not, but you better start thinking about it. And that's, you know, the, the solution to I'm not ready to sell my business was giving you all of the information you need to understand the value of your business and chart a path towards your exit in your hands as opposed to 27 different blog articles on quietlight.com type of thing. Uh, and then at some point you get comfortable with making contact with an advisor and understanding you've got a better understanding of your business and you ha will have a better understanding of what that conversation will entail. The, the problem historically has been that there's so much misinformation out there. And sometimes a broker has a sales stigma to them and you're not ready to talk to them uh, because you don't want to engage in selling your business. That's not what we do. We want to help people understand the value of what they have. So when they're eventually ready to sell their business, we can help them as well. Uh, it's a different mindset that we've always had. And it's tough to change the mindset of the entrepreneur to understand that and have a conversation. So that's what the book is for. It's going to give them all that information in their hands. Okay. Make them more yeah, comfortable, I, hopefully. Well, I love that. And you mentioned in their fear, you know, that people might be afraid to actually engage with you guys. And whether it's cost basis or whether, you know, whether it's just people like me who might talk themselves out of talking to an advisor strictly for the reason that I'm looking at my situation going, oh, what a mess. It's not worth anything. You know, who could ever take this over when maybe a trained eye, like maybe an advisor in your office, for example, or, or anybody else could look at it and go, no, 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 there's things here. You need to fix this, 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 and this. But this stuff is of value. So like, let's, you know, put that yeah. on and start doing this. So I think it could be a confidence builder to speak to an advisor. Yeah. Let me give you an example. You know, I go to, I, there's a particular mastermind that um, we as quiet light attendance sponsor uh, on an annual basis. And um, after meeting this particular business owner and his partner for a couple of years in a row, we sat down and we talked and he was kind of despondent. Uh, one of the two and thought, you know, we've been doing this for five years and we just don't feel like, there's a lot of value, you know, we think it might be worth four or $500,000. And that just doesn't feel like a lot after five years. And that's the situation where they undervalued what they had. 
And so we went through their financials. It took two years, by the way, to get them comfortable to have a conversation with me. Two years, all right? Um, they've got an amazing brand, a great product, and their business is growing. And right away, the business was worth, you know, 1.1, 1.2 million. So that, that got them, wow, okay, it's worth twice as much. And then we looked at the growth trends based upon the way they were growing. In another 12 months, it was going to be worth one and a half and two. And they're at the point right now where their, their mindset went from two years ago um, of, eh, maybe it's worth four or $500,000 to now they're looking at, we're focused on an eight figure exit. They're looking at a $10 million plus dollar exit in the next 24 months because they got so excited and motivated and knew you know, how to adjust and shift the business to make it more attractive to buyers and not get lost in the daily grind and just get tired and worn out like we all do as entrepreneurs from time to time. And, and honestly, I feel that way right now. I'm just going to tell you right now. So I totally get this from an emotional standpoint. When you set those goals and have those conversations, your, your heart can be lifted and you can just see, you get motivated um, with what the potential and possibilities are when you, when you truly understand the value of what you have and how much it can be worth in 12, 18, 24 months. It's really fun to be honest with you from an entrepreneur standpoint, because that's what we're all about. Well, yeah. And I imagine that there's a lot of just sort of insecurity, you know, built into especially small business owners or people like in their case where they were grossly undervaluing their success. Yeah. You know, they probably felt a little insecure, man, after five years, this is all it's worth, you know, like, I mean, that feeling probably, you know, true or not, right. The emotional aspect of it was steering the the way that they were handling their business. They weren't looking at a sale because they're like, oh, it's not worth it. You I know, love they, that you say insecure. You're absolutely right. And it's almost like they're embarrassed. You know, I had another guy come up to me and he's kind of embarrassed. I'm like, oh, geez, you know, is, is this an ad back? You know, it's a simple, basic ad back. And he didn't know he, he runs a business to a 5 million a year, but he was embarrassed to ask a question because he felt like he had to know. And if he didn't know, he looked, you know, thought maybe he was going to be stupid and it's, it's what I do. It's not what he does. So you shouldn't be, you know, embarrassed about asking the questions and learning. Um, you shouldn't feel insecure about your business as an entrepreneur. If you're making money as an entrepreneur, You've, you're a huge success, bottom line, right? You, you've done it. You don't have to get up at six o'clock in the morning to drive an hour and a half to work like a lot of people in this country do, you know, making not enough to support your family. As an entrepreneur, if you can generate side hustle revenue and make that a full-time job, you've already won, okay? Now, and let's say you've won the local lottery. Now you can hit the mega bucks by eventually having that exit. And the next time you do this, you already, you've got more knowledge and experience under your belt. So your, your time period from zero to an exit is going to be much shorter. The dollars will be much higher. You're not going to have to bootstrap it as much. You're not going to make as many mistakes. And you, and you get into this positive cycle of build, grow, repeat, launch, grow, build, repeat, selling them, you know, and it's almost the exitpreneur cycle where I've, I've seen, seen people do this over the last few years. They, they realize I sold that for 300,000. I'm going to do another. I just sold it for eight. And we have somebody I talked to today. First business was like $7,000. He's in the book, $7,000. The next was $20,000. The next was $400,000. Then he had a $9 million exit. He's the one I talked to earlier today that's looking for a $100 million exit. Never in his wildest dream seven years ago did he think he'd even have a $1 million exit. Life as an entrepreneur can change pretty rapidly when you, when you, have that experience of exiting your business and knowing that you can do it again based upon the experience that you have. Yeah. And I think it goes back to the, you know, this buzzword or this keyword of insecurity, right? Like once you've done the sale, once you've been through the process, you've witnessed, you know, firsthand how your business can grow and build and then be ultimately sold, you know, it's infinitely easier to do it the next time. It's like riding a bike, right? I mean, mm. you know, first time is really scary, but by time two, three, four, 10, 20, you know, eventually it becomes second nature. And, you know, I know that this is part of your experience as well, you know, having done this, you know, five or six times yourself. And, and I imagine each time you, you do it, it sort of is getting easier, you know, and you maybe have the advantage of talking to a lot of entrepreneurs while you're doing this, but, you know, yeah. nonetheless, you know, just the, the earned experience from spending the time, I think is critical. I love the insecurity aspect. I think you're, I think you're right on with that. Um, and part of the reason why I spent two years, pen to paper, so to speak, is to um, 
help people with that. Right. So if, if, if the theory would be you only gain that knowledge and experience when you go through the exit, well, that's really hard because you have to go through the exit first. You have to be confident enough to talk to an advisor to show them your embarrassing books or whatever the case might be. Um, the book itself, the playbook, the book I wrote, hopefully will allow people with those insecurities to gain some of that knowledge pre-exit. I guess that's the point of it. Can you help me with marketing the book, please? Right? <laughs> that's the point of it. Maybe it's to help people with that pre-exit knowledge. They haven't done it before, but I have. I've done it personally and I've done it professionally for lots of other people. And I took that information and I, and, I, and I put it in a book so that they didn't have to wait to go through it themselves and make all the mistakes that myself and so many others made. Do you have any kids? You got any teenagers? Yeah, I got yeah. two boys. And actually, that's been a big part of this uh, legacy thought. Lately. Do they listen or do they want to make their own mistakes? Yeah, it, well, 50 <laughs> 50. We'll say, yeah, actually, exactly. Yeah, and we were the same as kids. Up. <laughs> we were the same as kids. Our parents give us advice and we're like, yeah, what do you know? You're old. You didn't go through what we're going through. This, you know, the same holds true. Uh, you know, if I could chart my kids' path um, and tell them if they did everything I told them to do, they'd probably get to that endpoint much quicker, but they have to find their own path and they're going to be different people. And it is actually a different time in history. Uh, the same is true for the book. I guess it's, sharing all that information uh, to help people understand what's ahead without actually having to leap ahead and make all the mistakes. They're still going to make mistakes. That's life. Even when you're 80, you're still going to make mistakes, but it's, it's there to help people overcome their insecurities. I'm going to use that. Thank you. Well, yeah, no, like I've got this uh, phrase that I throw around every now and then when I'm feeling bummed out or depressed, like I haven't done enough with my business, you know, not unlike the guys you mentioned, you know, assuming their business just isn't worth what it might be worth. Um, you know, and, and basically it goes something like, it's not very articulate, but it goes something like, you know, it's taken every step it's ever, every step I've ever taken has led me to today. Right. So every step I've ever taken, there was no right, there was no wrong, but there was no other way for me to get on the phone today with Joe Valley other than the path I took. Yeah. And so, and by doing that, and then, you know, reading things like the entrepreneurs or exitpreneurs playbook and other materials that I consume day to day, you know, that are, are to, you know, work on finances or work on, you know, uh, business management or work on, you know, people skills or, you know, whatever, you know, each of those things might be a shortcut, but they're all just one step on that journey. And, and I think by removing sort of the, you know, the blame and it goes back to insecurity, right? I mean, I'm insecure about some of the, you know, past choices. How come I'm not doing better? Why am I not further along? You know, those sorts of things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but by being able to sort of think about it as this journey and just understand there's no missteps, there's just only one road and this was it. Yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's going to be missteps. I, I mean, if we're just talking about life as an entrepreneur, it, it, we all make mistakes. We all screw up. Uh, the key thing is just getting back up, dusting yourself off and getting back on track. And the more uh, relationships you can have with people that have been there and done that and uh, advisors that you trust, uh, the better off you're going to be, whether that's a, a paid for coach or an, a, an older mentor that's already uh, sort of charted, charted the path and, and can tell you all about the things that he or she did um, uh, in, their, in their life on their own entrepreneurial journey. It's important to have all those people in your life. I think, I think that's critical. Um, let's get back into the, uh, the muck a little bit. I wanted to talk about pricing and sort of uh, establishing our value and not leaving money on the table. I think, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about sort of the entrepreneur who might, you know, over, or in this case, it was under evaluate their business due to sort of emotional reasons, but how do we sort of, I guess, conquer the other side of that, where we become greedy and we're trying to take too much and get that price just sort of right in that sweet spot. What, what sorts of things can we do to start to evaluate our business and understand its value? Well, uh, first understanding the formula, right? Net income plus back, add backs equals sell us discretionary earnings. And if you have an inventory based business and you hold an average of $150,000 worth of inventory, that's separate. It's outside of that formula. So the inventory is sold separately. You got to understand that basic thing. And then, you know, what most people go to is the right to the multiple. So once they understand multiple of what and how to calculate what, that being discretionary earnings, they can jump to the multiple. And, and, there's two different types of multiple ranges. Actually, there's probably eight, right? Uh, first is, is what type of business do you have? Meaning, are you a third-party seller business, like an Amazon-only business? And if we just talk physical products at the moment, Amazon, FBA business, or do you have your own website 
where you're selling 90% of your wares on your own line, on your own website, and you've got ownership of the customers. There's advantages to that, that that is actually more valuable than the FBA business. And then you, you break it down into size of the business. You know, that does matter. A lot of people that are just getting into buying an online business, they say, well, look, I, I just want to, I want to buy something small. I want to take a little less risk and just spend a hundred thousand dollars. Well, that's actually the riskiest type of business to buy because it's very small and young and not established. And so it's actually riskier. So with a riskier business saying do, doing discretionary earnings of less than a hundred thousand, the value ranges for your own website might be three to four times. But if it was doing a million dollars in discretionary earnings, it's going to be six plus times. So size matters greatly. And it, the, the breakdowns are generally less than a hundred thousand in discretionary earnings, and then a hundred to 500,000 in discretionary earnings. These are just the breaking points, not set in stone, 500 to a million, and then a million. So with each step up, the multiple ranges go up as well. But with the multiple ranges, it's always just that, a range, right? Because no two businesses are alike and there's so many nuances to them. If there's two businesses that are doing $400,000 in discretionary earnings, they're both four years old. They both have nine SKUs generating an equal amount of revenue, but one is just an Amazon FBA business and the other is 50% Amazon and 50% of their own site. The second one may be in the three to five time range where the first one might be in the two to five time range. Very, very broad ranges still. But that three, that extra point there, you know, may make a difference of $400,000 in the list price, right? So that you can get with broad value ranges, but then you got to deep dive into the risk, the transferability, the growth of the business, the growth opportunities, the built-in pass to growth, the documentation, please have documentation, your financials, right? Please. Um, you got to get all those things right and minimize the risk for your buyers so that you can maximize the multiple when you sell your business, the lower the risk, the higher the multiple. And there's all sorts of little things you can do in the business to maximize that multiple. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Um, I wanted to talk to you about, so, and this is maybe kind of a question for the buyers and the sellers. So there is this thing for anybody who doesn't know, I mean, we have a largely entrepreneurial audience. So I'm sure everybody's familiar with the SBA, but yeah. there was something that you mentioned in your book or small business administration for anybody who doesn't know. Um, they offer financing and things like that to help, you know, entrepreneurs start businesses. And I guess maybe, maybe I was just too naive to realize it, but you talk a little bit about in, in your book about being eligible to be bought by an SBA loan. And I guess what hadn't occurred to me is the fact that some business person later stage entrepreneur may go get SBA financing to pay for a business or to purchase a business. Right. And so I wondered, you know, especially if you're selling to maybe a first time entrepreneur or somebody who can leverage SBA funds, what can we do or how, how could a business be eligible, eligible to be purchased by SBA funds versus one that might not? That's a great question. And let me first start with a why. Why in the world would you want to be bought by somebody that is going to get an SBA loan? Because they're going to pay more for your business, number one, and because it's going to be essentially all cash to you at closing. Two very, very powerful reasons. That's the why. Now the how. You cannot, co well, you cannot, there's always exceptions to every rule. One, one business, one, one bank account. Don't have three different businesses that you're commingling in one bank account. So if you've got one LLC, but you've got three different companies all inside that LLC, that's called commingling. It's all on one tax return. So you want to separate them out so that you've got one business, one tax return. That's the key. You can, um, after the fact, um, have your CPA, I forget the term, but they can separate them out. You pay them $1,500, $2,000, and they can set that, separate them out and prepare it uh, for, for the uh, SBA lender, and that's acceptable. So no commingling is the first goal. The second goal is two years worth of income, two years worth of tax returns as a minimum, ideally three, um, but two years as a minimum. The problem with the SBA loan aspect is they take an average of the two or three years tax returns. So if you've got you know, uh, $500,000 in discretionary earnings this year or net income on the tax return, but last year you were only at 50,000, they're going to take the average of the two to determine whether or not the business uh, can support 
a million dollar loan. Because ultimately what they care about is uh, you being able to uh, support your family and pay back the, the loan, right? That's how they're analyzing the business. What are your expenses as a buyer? And um, is there enough left over from this business to support the loan? That's what they want. So they want two, ideally three years worth of tax returns. So don't co-mingle, get three years worth of tax returns. It's okay to still do what you do as an entrepreneur and you know, have those nice owner benefits as an entrepreneur. Your mobile phone is in your business. Your meals and entertainment sometimes. You're going to buy a new laptop. It's a business expense. That's fine. All that can go on, you know, and into your tax returns because the SBA lenders can do a bit of an add back schedule as well. But the, but, but the two most important things are time, two to three years of clean tax returns, and two, clean tax returns without commingling. If you don't get two right, you can fix it after the fact. You can't fix time. So you got to give that time factor there. At the end of the day, if you do both of those things and you list your business for sale, you will have twice as many offers than if you're trying to sell the business for all cash. I promise you, maybe even three times as many offers. And if you've got two or three times as many offers, you get to pick your buyer. And it's not always you know, the most cash. Oftentimes it's the best buyer for your business that you're going to get all the way through to closing. But you will get more money from an SBA buyer in most cases as well. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's good advice. I think, um, you know, especially that stuff about commingling, I, you know, again, speaking from personal experience, you know, and I know I'm laying a lot of my garbage out here on the line today, but, yeah. um, you know, but I mean, as a person whose business ostensibly grew out of a freelance operation, you know, where it was just side money and then it became a business and, you know, it really only became a business because we were doing enough money to make it, you know, not really just a side hustle anymore. How old is this side hustle? That's a real business. I've been doing it in one form or another for about 15 years. And so you have an LLC. Have you set up a scorp or LLC? Yep. We do have an LLC and we do have our own, you know, checking and everything for the, for the business. And, uh, you know, but there's still a lot of cleaning up that, that my CPAs are having to do at the end of the year. My bookkeeper is doing at the end of the year. Do you and have I, your CPA firm doing your bookkeeping or do you have your CPA no, doing? I have it? separate. I have a separate bookkeeper uh, okay. from the CPA. So, so yeah. they're providing books. We did it the other way uh, for a while when I was younger and it, it never went that well. Yeah. CPAs are there for tax mitigation and tax filing purposes only. Uh, bookkeepers, they give, you the, they give you the numbers at the end of every month so it, it, you as the business owner can analyze them and go, okay, I need to fix this. I'm spending too much money on advertising. It's gotten to be 18% of my total revenue instead of my target of 15. That's what any commerce bookkeeper is there for so that you can steer the ship and you've got the information from that e-commerce bookkeeper. A CPA, they don't care about any of that. All they want to do is file your taxes and, and reduce your tax burden. And that's never going to help you. You know, your, your, your profit loss statement is not going to be in the right shape from a CPA, in my experience. So yeah, no, good for sense. you. Well, and then I wanted to ask, I mean, so as far as the commingling thing and keep, keeping clean books and all that kind of stuff go, I mean, let's say that you are into a business several years, you've now decided you want to sell, you've got kind of mucky books that do have some commingling and stuff like that. Is that basically, you know, today I decided I'm going to sell in three years. Is that like starting the clock and I need to go get clean bank accounts, clean everything and start clean? Or like, I mean, do you have to shutter a business and restart it? Like, I mean, what is the, uh, or what would be the protocol for, I guess, a, an older business that hasn't been doing the right thing for a long time? Yeah, um, no, it's, it, it, I guess, course correct so that they could get back on track. So it, none of the paths are, are easy. I'm sorry, but it's, it's, you know, you're going to make an awful lot of money on the exit and that's your goal. So you got to do some work, unfortunately. There's no snap of the fingers and don't worry about it. We'll just have the banker do that at the end of the day. They don't do that. Um, you should, if you've got three companies in one LLC, you go down, you go to a, uh, whatever online service to set up a new corporation and ink file, set up two new corporations, get it done, go to your bank, set up two bank accounts, move seed money over to the other two, get new credit cards and just start transferring two of the three out of that bank account. The one that you plan on selling, leave that one intact, move the other two out and then file separate tax returns all along the way. If you just do that for one year prior to selling, you'll have one year's worth of clean tax returns. And then you can take the prior two years and have your CPA set up. And again, the term is, is, is escaping me, but essentially what they do is they show the uh, IRS um, or the banker, the SBA lender, 
how it would have looked if you had a if you hadn't commingled and they sign off on that as a as a certified public accountant and that's acceptable to the bank and acceptable to the SBA so even if you just do that for one year it's okay okay so it can be done but it's messy and it'll probably be expensive but it, it all depends upon your definition of expensive it can be oh. done it should be done uh, if you if you decide to separate them out um, prior to closing you know you're probably looking at a couple of thousand dollars but it's not a day's worth of work. It's not a week's worth of work. And you certainly can't ask them to do that between March and April. So you got to think about them and the work that they've got to do because they've got to set aside the hours to do it. And uh, you're probably not their only client. So you got to think about other people too. That's probably not a good sign. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, commingling is one of these things, but can we talk about just some other easily avoided missteps that might come up along the way? Like just the common mistakes that business owners make that either would hinder their sale or make some a business unsellable altogether. Yeah. Um, the first, the first common mistake is, you know, when it comes to the bookkeeping that they just do cash accounting instead of accrual accounting, businesses are, are sold on, you know, a multiple of discretionary earnings and the the the, the PL format should be accrual. Uh, the difference is that the, if you traditionally hold two hundred thousand dollars worth of inventory, for example, uh, and this goes the same for content sites and and whatnot, and I'll explain why. But your net income is going to be depressed by two hundred thousand dollars because you're paying if it's cash, because it's it's on the PL. That should be on the balance sheet, not on the PL, and your net income should be two hundred thousand dollars higher. So your business is going to be sold for more. So that's why you should do accrual accounting. Um, if you're buying a business, folks, if you're out there on the hunt, and you're buying directly from a seller and they present you with a business that's growing year over year and they're, sh they're showing you cash accounting, buy it because you're going to get instant equity in the business. When you flip it to accrual, the business is probably going to be worth more because that discretionary earnings is probably higher because you're flipped to accrual and uh, the Inventory is now on the balance sheet instead of uh, the profit and loss statement. Um, the other thing that you want to look at is the risk profile of the business. You know, uh, age is obviously one we've talked about that. But what if you have one client or one SKU um, doing 70% of the revenue of the business? That's risky. Right. If that one client or one skew comes up, up with a lot of competition and sales drop or margin shrink because it costs more money to add, to drive traffic, it's it's a risk profile. So you want to diversify and make it a well balanced business that goes for the clients, for the SKUs, for the platforms that you reach. If you've got one Facebook ad driving 90% of your traffic, that's a huge risk, especially in these days with Facebook where the algorithms are constantly changing. I've seen a business go from 2 million in value to 800,000 in value because of that exact situation. They had one ad driving 90% of the traffic and they couldn't, the ad was disallowed and then they couldn't create another ad that would work as well. Well, and God forbid a situation like happened just the other day when Facebook goes down for a day. Yeah. That's all your sales for the week or whatever, you know, because Facebook's down. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a problem. And, I, you know, understandably, it doesn't happen a lot. But I think they said that like Zuckerberg himself was down six billion that day or something. It's like, you know, nobody I mean, feels sorry I, for him. Yeah, nobody feels <laughs> bad for him. But more or less, the difference. lots of businesses in there that might be relying on their one successful Facebook ad. Yeah. Nobody feels sorry for him at all. But you want to think about the risk of the business, the growth trends, uh, the transferability of it, and, and the documentation. And you get all of these things firmed up, cleaned up, and ready for a new owner to take over. And when all of these things are, I call them what buyers want with the four pillars of value. When all of them are, are, are well balanced and, and in the favor of the buyer, you will get a higher multiple for your business and the deal structure will be better as well. If there's a lot of risk associated with the business, they may ask for an earnout, which means that you're going to get paid as the business grows and they're going to offset their risk by you, you know, getting paid with future revenue. Those are the types of things that you can take care of in advance by, by balancing the risk, the growth, the transferability, and the documentation of the business. There's, there's six different levels to each of those four that I just mentioned. So it can't go too deep on it. There is a fifth pillar that uh, sort of goes without, it's not talked about enough and you, it's you as a person. So uh, we know the political environment is very split today. You know, I, I don't want to get into politics and which side or I may or may not be on, but you've, you've got to think about yourself as an owner of a business 
And what you put out there on social media or anywhere uh, with hard stances on very divided topics, whether it's politics or anti-vaxxing or vaxxing, whatever it might be, you can't draw that line unless you're willing to eliminate half the buyer pool for your business. By way of example, I did a podcast the other day and we're talking about this very thing. And the host of the podcast had a red sweatshirt on with Trump on it. And, you know, anybody that doesn't like Trump or hate Trump, uh, if he showed up, you know, if he wanted to sell his business and they did some research on him, which hopefully they're going to because they're going to spend a million or two million dollars, they may see some of the comments and things that he says on social media and immediately have a divide because they don't trust him because he's an avid avid Trump supporter, for instance, or it could be the reverse. You know, you just can be real careful about what you say as the owner of that business to instill trust and confidence in your buyer, in you, because they want to buy a business from somebody that they trust and like and can stick around with in due diligence and be there. You know, I want you there after training and transition, but if you're going to show up with a Trump shirt on every day and I hate him, we're going to have an issue and you're going to eliminate your buyer. So you just want to be real careful about, you know, politics, religion, uh, vax versus anti-vax and all those things that you're posting online. You may not think it matters, but it matters a great deal. I've seen deals go sideways or fall apart or never get an offer because of the things that you can find on people on social media. Well, I imagine, and, and you mentioned it's not spoken often enough, this idea of the person or the individual owner, you know, because we, and even much of our conversation has been, you know, back to, you know, multiples and, and income and, and discretionary spending and all these kinds of things, right? We're talking yeah. about business terms, but I mean, you know, one of these old phrases or whatever is that we do business with those we like and trust, you know, we know mm-hmm. them and trust them. And even if it's totally, you know, maybe it's not completely accurate, but you see this guy wearing a shirt of somebody that, you know, you oppose or you feel strongly against one way or the other, Yeah. you know, sure. I, I mean, you know, even if you don't mean for it to make a difference, you know, it, maybe you just don't feel comfortable shaking the guy's hand, you know, so <laughs> for some reason that's enough to push you off the, the offer, even if, you know, relatively speaking, everything else is okay. Yeah. You know? And so, uh, so I think you're right. And I think there is, you know, obviously there's lots of, of uh, traps to step in these days in social media, you know, it's pretty tough to up on whatever the hot button thing is of each day. Yeah. But, you know, and I think, and I imagine too, there are plenty of businesses that, you know, the character of the leadership is sort of the business, right? You're buying the company because it's Ben and Jerry's and we love Ben and Jerry, you know, yeah. or whatever. But, um, but I, I think it's a, a valid point and definitely something to consider. I sold the business a few years ago. I, I talk about it in the book. Uh, the owner of the business was like 72 years old. He's my favorite, most memorable client ever. It was at a time when online businesses were, uh, it was hard to sell them. It was early on. It might've been 2014, right? Not too far after the great recession. And you know, multiples weren't going up. Uh, and and this online business, that's so risky. I can't, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of money on that. So much risk. And the highest that we could list something was like at a 2.7 or so. And this guy, John, he had a content business. He traveled the world. He and his wife would you know post contests every day about where they were. And he made about $400,000 a year on affiliate money and advertising and things of that nature. And he was so likable and so trustworthy. I just, you know, I wanted to have dinner with him, right? He was just a great guy that even with me, he didn't sell me on listing the business at a higher value. He just presented himself in such a way that when he said, look, uh, I want to list a business at a four-time multiple, just get me on the phone. I'll have conversations with him. We'll build that trust. We'll get this business sold. I took a leap of faith. And we went from a typical business being sold at a one point, a 2.7 multiple to a four time multiple. And John got multiple offers on the 400,000. It was listed at $1.6 million. So let me just do the math on that. So it's a 1.3 difference on the multiple times $400,000. Yeah, I have to do that with a calculator, folks. It's a difference of $520,000 because John was likable. He was trustworthy. He presented the facts in a way that made people believe that or understand that they could do it as well. And, and this, and that they could do it better down the road because he was, you know, the business was 17 years old and he, you know, it, it was outgrowing him, but he didn't try to sell you on all the, 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 the pizzazz of the business. He presented the facts in a way that you just, 
liked him, trusted him and wanted to do business and bought it by his business. It made a difference of over a half a million dollars when he sold his business because of the person he was. Take that with a grain of salt. It's just not magic, but think about it when you post that next post on social media or you, you just take a hard stance uh, against something because half of the people that may be your buyers disagree with you, no matter what half they land on or you land on. That doesn't matter. Just hold back for a couple of years as you're selling your business. Do the right thing. Build a great business for a great buyer to take over at a great price. Think about them, that buyer, instead of yourself as you're building that business, and you will actually benefit from the sale in much, much more ways than if you just think selfishly and post post things that are not appropriate and, and grow the business strictly for yourself so you can cash out at the end. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. And I think they say, you know, I mean, most people vote with their wallet, right? I mean, we spend money with the companies we like, with the companies we trust. You know, we're we're not spending money with the the shady whoever or the the guy we don't like doing business with. You know, I mean, there's a, a particular car sales company here in the, in the area where I, I live. And, you know, I've been to several of their dealerships recently looking for a car and like just the, their sales process, the way they train their sales employees, all that stuff, like it all just rubs me wrong. And, yeah. you know, at first it could have just been one bad sales guy, but I've been in several of their places and they're all the same, you know? And so it's like, okay, so I don't want to do business with this company. They may be great on paper. And maybe if they were to sell, they would be a perfect candidate for being a sold business. But I would never choose them because I don't trust their people, which for me, you know, speaks to leadership and everything else. Yeah. And so, yeah, sure. uh, so I think you're right. And, you know, even though it's not, I guess, magic, you know, it is definitely secret sauce or, you know, sprinkling on top or, or something that, uh, you know, building good relationships with, you know, those you want to work with and being, you know, sort of a, an authentic person, you know, and giving people a good view of who you are, can, you know, can definitely work in your favor and, you know, equally work against you. Yeah, it, you're the mortar that holds the four pillars together, no doubt. And those four pillars of what buyers want are that risk, growth, transferability, and documentation. If uh, if you're not a good person, um, doesn't matter. You're not going to get as much value for your business if you don't if you don't present yourself well. So you're just going to be careful about that. No, I think that's great, and I think it's also a great place to uh, to wrap this up. Joe, do you want to give people just a quick insight where they can find you online if they chose to engage with you online, maybe to work with them as a advisor, or if they just wanted to pick up the book or learn more about the Expertpreneur uh, Plan or Playbook? Yep, absolutely. You can find me uh, on LinkedIn, Joe Valley on LinkedIn. You'll find me there. Uh, Twitter's Expertpreneur at Expertpreneur. Uh, you can find a book uh, on Amazon. Just do a search there or go to Expertpreneur.io. And if you're a current business owner, first of all, you should, if you don't want to have that conversation with an advisor, buy the book, set your goals, get some experience so you're not as insecure, and then reach out to quietlight.com uh, so that you can firm up where you are today in terms of your values, so you know how close or how far you are from your goals. Yeah, nope, I love that. Well, thank you so much, Joe. I really appreciate you. Everybody, here's the book once again. It's the uh, an Exit, Exitpreneur's Playbook. The, uh, the subtitle is How to Sell Your Online Business for Top Dollar by Reverse Engineering Your Pathway to Success by Joe Valley. Thanks so much, Joe. We really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And thanks so much to everybody who tunes into the show this week and every week. And we'll see you guys next time. 